Welcome to Mountain West Small Talk, I mean Ruby Conference. Um, there will be small talk. Um, my name is Randy Coleman. My wife says it's pronounced like Soul Man if you ever have trouble remembering. Um, I get it all kinds of different ways. And apparently this is my way of getting my name on one slide as many times as I possibly can because I'm really creative with picking my, my usernames. So today I want to talk about affordances and how they relate to programming languages. This is a faucet that you might see in like a hotel sink or bathtub. Can anybody actually figure out how it would work? I mean, it's a faucet, right? You should be able to turn it on. You should be able to get hot and cold water out of it. It doesn't really kind of, kind of hard to figure out. Fortunately, this one comes with instructions, sort of, kind of. Maybe not. So in the physical design world, there's this concept of affordances. Now, I first heard about it in a book by Donald Norman called The Psychology of Everyday Things. He's re-released it as The Design of Everyday Things. If you, do any, if you build anything that people are going to use, I recommend the book. It's got a lot of really good advice in it. But an affordance is a quality of an object or environment that allows someone to perform an action. It affords that action. And it's also come to mean a little bit whether that object actually communicates the action you can perform with it. So you see a button and you know you can push it. You see a, a, you know, a knob and you know you can turn it. A switch, you can flip it, those kinds of things. Those are affordances. Um, affordances also apply, or actually, sorry, I want to look, look at a couple more examples first. So this is like a walk light, and you see this, these bright red lights that push, but really you have to push that button down below, and they had to put arrows on the thing to point out where you actually need to push. I'm guessing a lot of people get confused by that. Here's another example. It's the back door of a bus. Now, there's these bars on the right and the left that you think maybe you can push on those bars, but no, you have to touch the yellow strip, and because that wasn't clear enough, they had to actually add the white arrows as well to communicate. How do you operate this door? How do I get off the bus? So these are not very good affordances, but you can also have really, really good affordances. For example, if you walked up to an escalator that looked like that, it immediately communicates what you should do. You want to stand, you, you go on the right. If you want to walk down, you go on the left. So there's good and bad affordances. And affordances can also apply to software. I mean, the, the obvious place is um, UI design. You want your UIs to communicate how they're supposed to be used and, and what you're supposed to do with them. But even API design can have affordances. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Amir Rajan who's been doing a series of JavaScript screencasts called Coding Out Loud. And he's been doing a series on REST APIs. And he's building a little um, tic-tac-toe game API. And in his, the JSON packets that come back, there's actually documentation about how to use the API. And it also gives you a list of here's all the URLs you can hit that are legal given the current state of the game. And so that affords um, you, know, you as the programmer using that API. It's an affordance that you can use to, to operate the game. And in this talk, I'd like to suggest that affordances also apply to programming languages. Different languages afford different kinds of design, and they influence different kinds of solutions to problems. So let's look at a simple example, the Humble Point class. This example, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use some ideas from Smalltalk to try to come up with a better Ruby solution to a problem. All my examples are going to apply to Ruby, since this is a Ruby conference. And I'll be drawing from the languages I'm most familiar with. I program in Smalltalk and C++ every day, and more and more Ruby as I go as well. Um, so you're going to see a fair bit of small talk um, and some C++ as well, and hopefully that won't scar you too badly. So here's a simple point class in Ruby. Um, you can use a struct for this. Many people have probably written something like this. Just very simple. You create a new point with an x and a y coordinate. But what happens if you want to support polar coordinates? <laughs> now, if you don't know what polar coordinates are, we're used to specifying points in a Cartesian plane with an x and a y coordinate. But polar coordinates, you can specify the exact same point with a radius or a distance from the origin and an angle from the positive x-axis. And it turns out that, like in uh, orbital mechanics and radial motion equations, the equations are a lot simpler if you use polar coordinates. Um, you know, that the radius and the angle basically describe a vector, if you're familiar with that from physics. And if you've watched Despicable Me, you know that a, a vector has both direction and magnitude. Um, so you can you can specify points in two ways. Now, we look at our simple point class we're looking at. We only have one constructor, and it already takes two numbers. So how would we say, no, this point needs a radius and an angle instead of an x and a y? I suppose we could add like a little tag parameter or something that specifies that. I used to work with a lady named Anna, and every time I'd see code like that, my nose would crinkle up, and she'd go, you're making the poo face again. So when I think of solutions like that, I make the poo face. Um, so let's look at small talk. 
So this is the exact same code in Smalltalk. It looks a little wordier. I mean, Smalltalk, you work in a coding environment. You don't actually have all this text on the screen when you're looking at it, but this is kind of how you communicate your code in a flat medium like this. Um, in Smalltalk, every method uses keyword arguments, so those colons are, are the keywords. Um, and every method has a unique name of some sort. And so we define a class method on point called x colon y colon that takes the two parameters and it delegates to an instance side method to initialize the instance variables. Ruby's doing that for, that for you under the hood, by the way. It's the same thing. And you construct it by sending the x colon y colon message to point. And that's how we construct a point. So to support polar coordinates in small talk, the solution is obvious. Just add another name that's called r colon theta colon. It takes a radius and an angle. And this one just delegates to the XY constructor using the trig trigonometry formula you learned in high school and then had to go look, look up on Google because you forgot your high school trigonometry. But you just send the R colon theta colon message to point and you get a point in polar coordinates. So Smalltalk has this affordance of named constructors. Can we apply that to Ruby? Yes, we can. We can make class methods in Ruby. So in this case, I've made an xy method that takes an x and a y, and it just delegates to the normal constructor, the new, new method. And then I can make another constructor called self.polar that takes the radius and theta, use the same trigonometry formulas, bonus points for pretending to make the new method private. And nothing's ever really private in Ruby, I know that, but at least it communicates something about my intended use of the class. And you can construct both kinds of points, like at the bottom there, point.xy or point.polar. And so we've been able to take an idea from Smalltalk called name constructors or an affordance from Smalltalk and apply that to Ruby to come up with a solution to the problem of how can we make points both ways. Let's look at another really simple example, the find method in Ruby or detect, as it's also known. Smalltalk calls it detect. If I wanted to look through an array of numbers for an odd number, I could write something like this in Smalltalk. Now, I'm not gonna give you a whole lot of Smalltalk syntax training here. Um, Noel's gonna do that this afternoon, so come and, come and watch Noel's talk. But the, the hash with the parens, that's a literal array in Smalltalk, and the square braces are a block. Um, I know using each as a variable name is a little bit confusing to Ruby programmers because there's a each method in Ruby, but Smalltalk, the idiom is that your, your loop variable or your, your, your variable in a, in, a, in a block is called each often. And so this is looking through that array for an odd number, anything that responds true to the odd message. And in Smalltalk, it doesn't return nil if you can't find one, it actually raises an exception. So that's what happens in this case. Exact same code in Ruby. I'm using find instead of detect because it seems like most people prefer find, so I'm trying to be a little bit idiomatic here. And Ruby will return nil if it's not found. What if you wanted to return something else? You didn't want an exception, you didn't want a nil. Well, in Smalltalk, you can pass multiple blocks to a method. So I can use detect if none instead. Now, Smalltalk has keyword arguments again, so if I want to add a parameter, I have to add another keyword. Um, and so I can pass two blocks. The first block is looking the criteria that I'm looking for. And the second block is, what, what should I return if I can't find one? And hash none is a, is a symbol in Smalltalk, just like colon none would be in Ruby. So Smalltalk has this affordance of passing multiple blocks to methods. Um, and actually, that's how conditionals are done in Smalltalk, but that's a whole other topic. So we have this affordance of multiple blocks. Can we do this in Ruby? Well, it turns out this is built into Ruby. How many of you knew that Ruby could take a per, an if none parameter? Anybody? Aaron knows, awesome. Nobody knows this. So I'm using a stabby lambda there, but you pass in an anything callable in, in, as a parameter to find, and that callable will get called if, it can't, if, the, if the condition can't be satisfied. And so I can run this and it'll return the none symbol. So in Ruby, you can do multiple blocks like in Smalltalk. It doesn't read as well. I kind of like having the condition I'm looking for come first and then the, the, the bad case come last. Nobody, nobody knows about this and nobody uses it because it really doesn't read quite as well. But you can do it. You can actually pass multiple blocks to Ruby methods. I think Avdi Grimm's done that a couple times on his Ruby Tapas screencasts, which are awesome, by the way. So this brings me to an idea called linguistic relativity. Um, you might also have heard of it as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, and I have no idea if I pronounced that correctly. But the idea is that languages influence thought, and the language you think naturally in will influence the kinds of thoughts you think and the kinds of ideas you have. Now, there's people that disagree that this is an actual real theory. There's been some experiments to try to prove or disprove it. There's a strong form and a weak form. You can go read the Wikipedia article like I did if you want to. Um, but this idea that languages influence thought is kind of intriguing to me. Um, Corey Foy did a talk 
uh, about a year and a half ago at Software Craftsmanship North America. Great talk, by the way. Um, but in his talk, part of his talk was, he talked about what does a language allow you to say and what does a language force you to say? And he gave a great example. If I was to come to you and say, I went to a movie with my neighbor, you might, come, you might ask me, especially if you're my wife, you might ask me, well, is your neighbor male or female? And unless you're my wife, I might answer, well, that's none of your business. But if I was speaking in a language like French, where the, where the nouns are gendered, so there's masculine and feminine forms of nouns, when I told you I went to a movie with my neighbor, I would be forced to tell you whether my neighbor was male or female because of that language. That language is forcing me to say something that English doesn't force me to say. And the same thing is true of programming languages. Our languages influence the kind of thoughts we have. Um, and Matz actually used this as one of his principles um, when he invented Ruby. He actually gave a talk in 2003 at OSCON about, about the design of Ruby, and he talked about this a lot. And one of the points he made is that languages are not only tools for communication, but also tools for thinking. And he invented Ruby to be a good thinking tool. That's one of his goals of, of, of Ruby, was to make it a good thinking tool. And I think it's great, actually. It's pretty good. So let's look at a couple more examples. These ones are slightly more involved. Um, now I'm going to get some C++ on you, and I apologize, but I'm going to do it anyway. A lot of times when we're, when we're programming, we have to clean up after ourselves. We work with finite resources all the time. Memory, uh, threads, uh, files, file handles, um, database connections, locks, things where you have to do something to acquire something and then release it when you're done. You have to clean up after yourself. Now, when we work in garbage collection, Oh, we don't have to worry about this anymore. That was C. We don't have to do that. Well, memory is only one kind of resource, and there's lots of different kinds of resources. So we have, to, we have to pay attention to cleaning up after ourselves. So how many of you have seen C code that looks something like this? <laughs> Anybody recognize that? There's two go-to fails right in the middle there. This is actually Apple's SS four weeks ago, if you don't recognize it. Um, I'm not going to try to fix Apple's problem, but the whole idea of this code is that you have to make sure that you free these buffers down at the bottom, no matter how you finish the function. So I'm going to look at a simpler example. I've written a very expressively named function called foo. Um, and it has to acquire a resource and make sure it releases it when it's done. And in, the, in between there, it does some work with it. Now, this code is buggy, and, and you shouldn't write code. And if you do, you should feel bad, because um, I did when I wrote it. <laughs> Um, the obvious problem is that if Baz doesn't give us the answer to life, the universe, and everything, it's going to early return, and we're not going to free our resource. That's a pretty obvious problem when you look at this code, but the less obvious problem is what if bar or Baz raises an exception? Same problem. We're dead. We acquire the resource. We catch the exception, go on our, about our business, leak the resource. You do that too many times, and your program crashes after a while. Maybe sooner, maybe later, but it crashes. So we have to do something about that, and we have to write our code differently because of that. Um, this solves the problem. We actually release the resource, but I start making the poo face again when I look at code like that. It's ugly. I have to duplicate the release of the resource. I have to catch an exception I don't care about at all. I have to rewrite the early return and end up with wedgie code. Uh, lots of nesting. I don't like it. So is there a better way? Well, it turns out in C++, there is a better way. Um, C++ has an affordance called deterministic destruction semantics. And the idea is when you allocate an object on the stack, like a local variable in a function or a method, um, when that scope exits, no matter how it exits, that destructor of that object will get called all the time right then, deterministically. And so you can use that property of C++ to make a little wrapper. Oh, sorry. I forgot a joke. Um, using, looking at code like that makes me think of using a stove like this. If you want to set medium heat, you have to press this button like six times. That's a bad affordance, bad design. Okay, so using deterministic structures, you can use this pattern in C++ called resource acquisition is initialization. Um, now, speaking of affordances, that pattern name is horrible. It doesn't communicate at all, but the basic idea is you can acquire a resource in a constructor, release the resource in a destructor, and you know when the destructor is going to get called. So you know what's going to happen. And so we can wrap a resource in a little wrapper class called safe resource. It acquires the resource in the constructor, releases the resource in the destructor, and I've got a little get method there just so that we can get out the raw resource. And I can rewrite foo using safe resource. 
exactly the same as the first example, except that I don't need the explicit release at the bottom. That's taken care of. But the point is, no matter how I exit this function, whether I early return, whether I get an exception, or whether I exit normally, that resource will get released automatically, and I don't have to do anything. As a programmer, I don't have to do anything special. I can use safe resource anywhere in my program I want, and I've got to do nothing extra special to handle that resource getting re released properly. Welcome to Mountain West Smalltalk. So we have this affordance of deterministic destructors. Can we apply this to Ruby? Well, Ruby doesn't have deterministic destructors, so what can we do instead? We can use begin and sure blocks everywhere where we use the resource. So in the ensure block, we actually release the resource. OK. You can actually define a finalizer on an object that will get called when the garbage collector collects the object. Ooh. Um, but, and also, we don't actually know when the garbage collector is going to run. If you're in a tight loop acquiring a resource a lot, um, you need that resource to get released really fast, because otherwise you could run out of it before the garbage collector gets a chance to run and run the finalizer. But Ruby has blocks, and blocks help us here quite a bit. So let's look at a Ruby example of the safe resource class. You know, initialize, acquires the resource, release, releases it, but we, then we have a class method called acquire that wraps the interaction with this object. So we, we allocate the, the object, also come to mean a little bit, and then we have an ensure that releases the resource. So whenever we exit that block, the resource will get released immediately, and we clean up after ourselves. So then we can look at our foo method, where we do safe resource.acquire, pass in a block that takes the resource, and no matter how we leave this block, that resource will get cleaned up. Now, you've seen this pattern. If you use file.open that takes a block, it opens the file for you, closes it when you're done. There's, this pattern is all over in Ruby, and it's a great pattern. And that is the option we have in languages with blocks when we have to deal with uh, resources. We don't have deterministic destructors, so you use this pattern with blocks. In Java, at least earlier, older versions of Java, you have to use a finally everywhere. So Ruby's blocks actually make this not too bad. It's, it's pretty nice syntax. It's not too noisy. Um, but everywhere where you use this resource, you can't just use it the way you normally would, like safe resource.new and then let it go away when you're done. So you have to change, as a, as a client of, this, of the resource, you have to change your programming pattern. And he's been doing a series on where that you handle the resource safely. And you can't really get rid of that duplication. Now, in Ruby, it's not that much duplication. It's not too bad. Other languages, it's worse. Um, Lisp actually uses macros for this. They have like a macro called with open file. It, you know, it opens the file, and then when, the, when you're done the code inside the block, it cleans it up. So we can do something like deterministic destructors in Ruby. It's not quite the same, but it's pretty good. And I, I highly recommend this pattern. Um, if you use this pattern in the C++ all the time, I mean, there's smart pointer classes that do this for you. The, the, the C++ uh, file stream classes do this for you. If you use this pattern everywhere, you completely eliminate a whole class of bugs. Anything to do with, with uh, leaking resources pretty much goes away with this pattern, so I highly recommend it. So we're going to look at one last example. Let's see where I'm on time. Oh, so this one works too, by the way. Um, one last example. Let's say we want to be able to read images of different types. Um, so we have this image reader, and we want this to be extendable so that if you're using my image reader library and you have your own image format you want to handle, you can just add an image reader class, and it will just hook into the framework. So how might we do this? I suppose you know a case statement is pretty much out if we want it to be extendable, because you don't want to have to go edit my case statement just to add your image reader in there. We could have some kind of registry, so you define your image reader class, and then you have to register that class with some kind of registry. Um, Let's again look at Smalltalk. And this is actually in the VisualWorks Smalltalk base image. I've changed the code a little bit. But, so there's this, a lot of code there. But basically what's going on here is there's a class method called from file that takes a file name, opens a binary. So these are, and then calls this reader class for method on the stream. And if that returns a class, then we instantiate the class on the stream down near the bottom there. If, if it returns nil, um, then we raise an error. So how does this reader class for method work? What's that all about? Well, it turns out Smalltalk, every class knows all of its subclasses. And so we can iterate those subclasses. Um, you can either use subclasses to get the direct descendants or all subclasses to get recursively all the subclasses. But here we just iterate the subclasses with a detect if none, which we saw earlier. And it resets the image stream back to the beginning so that we're always looking at the beginning of the file. 
and then just sends each class a can read message with the stream. And the, and the class will say, yes, I can read this stream, or no, I can't read this stream. And if we find one that returns true to can read, we'll return that as our image reader class. So just by virtue of there being a subclass of image reader that can read a certain image format, this code will automatically find that. I don't have to do anything special. I don't need a registry. I don't need a, a case statement. I don't need anything. I just polymorphically ask the class, hey, can you read this file? Can you read this file? Can you read this file? And the one that answers true will get to handle the file. This pattern works great. Um, it's used quite a bit in Smalltalk. I mean, you don't write it every day, but it's a really handy tool if you, if you have any kind of dynamic response. You can use it with like URI schemes, all kinds of things. So we have this affordance of subclass iteration. Well, what can we do in Ruby? Um, here's our image reader class. I've changed the names to be a little bit, I don't know, seem more Ruby-like. So we have image reader read, opens a binary stream on the file, calls find reader class on it, raises an error if it can't find a reader class, otherwise instantiates the, reader, the returned reader class on the stream. Well, how does find reader class work? Pretty much like small talk. Subclasses.find, you know, rewind the stream every time, ask the reader class, can you read this stream? Yes or no? Subclasses? We don't have that. What's that about? Well, it turns out, actually, if you're using active support, you do have that, at least in the latest versions. That's actually been built into Rails now. There's a subclasses for direct descendants and um, descendants for recursive. But if, you, if you're not using active support and you don't want to pull it in for this one thing, you can do this yourself. We have a lit takes the radius and theta, use the classes, and then we use the inherited hook that gets called every time a subclass of a class is, is, is loaded or created, um, that inherited hook gets called, and we can just shovel that subclass into the array. So we can do what Smalltalk is doing for us with you know, a couple lines of Ruby. You can actually keep track of all the subclasses. There's also extended for modules. If you need to do it there, you can hook into module extension. So using this code, if I want to write an, an image reader class, let's say for bitmaps, I just subclass image reader, I implement can read, and I return true if the first two bytes of the stream are DM, because that's how bitmaps are identified. Notice I'm not using file extensions here. I'm actually using the content of the stream. So this would work like if you're on a web server, we're not even getting file names. You're just getting images back from the server. You can, you can just use the data stream to tell what kind of file it is. And read image is where your actual reading code would go. Here I'm just spitting out a string because I didn't want to implement a whole bitmap reader. Um, JPEG image reader, same idea. Look for the FFD8, that's the signature. That dot B there is a Ruby 2.0 thing, and it's because encodings, and that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> um, and then a ping image reader. Well, pings actually have an 8-byte signature, and it's actually kind of fascinating what all those bytes are for. It's pretty kind of, it's kind of cool. You can look that up. I don't have time to go into it today. Again, the encoding thing on the end. Um, so if I've got a directory full of images, and I loop through them and ask the image reader to read them, it reads them just fine. And so when I, when I, if I wanted to write you know, something for, for GIFs, I could write a GIF image reader, subclass from image reader, implement can read, and read, and that's all I have to do. I don't have to do anything with the registry. I don't have to add to a case statement. I, all I've got to do is make sure that that image reader class gets required in and loaded. As soon as it's loaded, the, subclass, the inherited hook will fire, subclass will get registered, and it'll find my image reader. All right, so let's wrap up here. What did we learn? Um, hopefully, I've taught you a couple of Ruby tricks that you didn't know before. Um, maybe, maybe those will help you. And maybe I didn't teach you anything. That's fine. Um, but languages afford certain designs and inhibit other ones. And when you're thinking in a particular language, you tend to solve problems a certain way. And so you can take those ideas, the influences that that language have on your thought, and you can apply them to other languages and those will increase your solution space. You'll have more ideas about how to solve problems, you'll be more creative, and it'll make you a better programmer. So I really recommend learning more languages. I don't, you don't have to like write massive you know, production software in them, but learn them enough that you can start thinking a little bit fluently in that language. Learn the idioms and the patterns of that language, but don't go too far. Um, Years ago, I was kind of forced to work in Visual Basic 6, and you know, 13 years of small talk have almost finished my therapy, but not quite. Um, and Visual Basic 6 does not have implementation inheritance. Now, implementation inheritance is overrated, but when you need it, you need it, and I didn't have it there. And so I actually came up with a pattern to fake it with composition and delegation, and I'm pretty sure that none of my coworkers really understood what that code was doing. I took it too far. 
you need to write code that, you're, that the people are coming after you and that you work with are going to understand. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't use any ideas from other languages. I'm actually working on a little Ruby gem right now, and I've been learning JavaScript, and JavaScript has been influencing the way I write the code in that gem. Um, the more languages you know, the better designs you can come up with, the better solutions you can come up with. Um, another example of not going too far, there's a lot of people talking about, well, how can we apply functional ideas to Ruby? And actually, Ajo is going to be talking about that right after me. Um, and there's a lot of good ideas there, but if you tried to go like full-on immutable data structures where you never modify a structure, you always return a copy with the modification in it, you're going to cause problems for Ruby's garbage collector. It's just not optimized for that pattern. So you need to be careful using stuff like that. There's good ideas from functional, and, and they're worth learning. But like I said, don't go too far with it. So if you want more on this topic, I've actually wrote like a 10 or 12 part blog post series on my blog. There's the link to the, to the, uh, the category tag, and you can see that. There's, I, I tried to pick examples from there that apply to Ruby, but I've got some other examples in there as well. Um, I want to thank my company, Key Technology, for actually sending me to the conference and letting me come for the whole week. I really appreciate that. Um, I'll throw in the obligatory, we're hiring. So if you're tired of doing web stuff and you want to come and use Smalltalk and C++ and a small but growing amount of Ruby to, to shoot at food with, with supersonic air jets, talk to me. Um, I want to thank Rogar B, my local Ruby users group, because they, uh, they were guinea pigs for me for this talk. They let me do a dry run a couple weeks ago, and I got a lot of great feedback from them, so they're awesome. And Jen Myers is also awesome. She does some like beginner speaker mentoring, and I got to spend a half an hour on Skype with her one day, and she is really, really awesome. She's really, really passionate about helping uh, women who want to learn how to speak. So check her out if, you, if you're in that category and you want to get some mentoring from her. Um, there's some references to the things I've talked about. Yeah, I'll post my slides up too. Okay, but yeah, go ahead, take a picture if you want. All right, I'm way out of time, so uh, thank you very much.